Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk a bit about uh, topology in, in quantum matter. And I was asked to give a more of, uh, uh, broadly accessible introduction um, to the field. And uh, I want to elaborate a little bit of the goals of uh, our, our program. So, in particular, I want to show that uh, topology can enter uh, kind of condensed matter in, in, in different ways. And uh, in, in each way how it enters, uh, um, there will be some quite exciting features uh, arising from, from topology. So stepping back a little bit, I mean, what we are doing when we're studying, uh, uh, when we want to understand, uh, when we try to understand uh, uh, quantum matter, We're actually uh, aiming at a quite challenging problem, right? So, so even like a, a small crystal that we might want to, to understand, or we want to understand the physics of a small piece of uh, material, we actually have to deal with the order of 10 to 10 to the 23 uh, particles in, in our material. That already is quite big. I mean, the number of uh, kind of particles in in a, in a crystal is already comparable to the number of stars in the universe. Uh, however, if we want to understand the quantum mechanical properties of this material, it's actually getting slightly worse because we're actually dealing with an Hilbert space that has exponential of 10 to the 23. So basically, our main goal is to solve a problem in an uh, exponential of 10 to the 23 dimensional um, Hilbert space. And what we want to understand is we want to understand basically how all these particles uh, interact with each other, right? So we would have a Hamiltonian that describes our problem where we have a Hamiltonian of the electrons, the electron uh, um, of neutrons, and plus all sorts of uh, interactions. Right? So, so basically, this is what we want to understand. Uh, uh, this is like the, the, the great goal. Um, however, this is really extremely complicated, so, so we just have to focus on, on specific problems. And what we are doing is we're just focusing on usually quite simple model systems that actually do tell us quite a bit about uh, certain uh, features of, of our condensed matter problems. And one of the features, or one of the um, uh, themes that I want to focus on uh, today is on uh, how matter uh, occurs in different phases. And uh, to get started, I want to uh, discuss something that's very much uh, known to us, that uh, we have uh, like substances, for example, um, water can can either appear as, as in a solid state or it can be in a liquid state. So, uh, liquid water. Uh, and uh, in magnetic systems, for example, we can have a ferromagnet uh, or like a paramagnet. And in these cases, we say that uh, we have uh, uh, different phases of, of, of a material. Right? So we have like the, the solid or liquid, solid uh, phase and the um, liquid phase, and the magnetic, uh, ferromagnetic, and the paramagnetic um, phase of matter. And what we what we are used to is to distinguish uh, or classify different phases of matter in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So our 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 system has a certain um, symmetry. So for example. We have the continuous rotation and translation symmetry of space, or we have the magnetic rotation symmetry uh, of our um, spin degrees of freedom. And uh, this is spontaneously broken here. So we have here spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, while here we have uh, symmetric phases. And this is how we usually understand different phases of matter. We say that, well, we just analyze the symmetries of our system, and then we can just look at different phases of matter where the symmetries are um, spontaneously broken. And then on very general principles, we know that there is no way to adiabatically connect, say, uh, the symmetry breaking, uh, like the spontaneous symmetry broken phase to the symmetric one. And we know that the system has to undergo a phase transition if it's going from one to the other. Uh, and, and then we can draw phase diagrams that we are quite used to. So for example, we can do this for water. We can just heat up <coughs> water. Uh, we start doing this at ambient uh, pressures. And what we see is, well, here's the pressure. Then we see that at low temperatures, we have a, a solid ice. 
then we have liquid water, and then we have vapor. But in this system, we do observe actually two phase transitions, like from solid to liquid, and then from liquid to vapor. Uh, this is a bit puzzling to us because, well, liquid water and vapor do actually have the same symmetries. And in fact, if we go to higher pressures, we see that here we are coming to a critical endpoint, and in fact, we can go without undergoing, like without the system undergoing a phase transition, we can go from the liquid to the vapor phase or to the liquid state, to the vapor state. However, there's no way to go adiabatically or without a phase transition from the solid to the liquid. So, so, so this is the way how we do usually understand different uh, phases of matter, where we just do analyze symmetries, and then we can tell apart spontaneous symmetry broken phases from symmetric phases. And the naive instinct would be if we have now two symmetric states, that we can actually go adiabatically from one um, to the other. And uh, these phase transitions, as I've shown here, they're usually driven by thermal fluctuations, but in principle, and, and this is what we actually are looking at a lot, is phase transition can also happen at zero temperature when they're just driven by quantum fluctuations. Good. So this is the um, picture we are quite used to, and what I want to focus on in uh, the next 40 or so minutes is what is there uh, beyond spontaneous symmetry breaking. So what is there uh, beyond spontaneous symmetry breaking? And what I want to argue is that we can have several cases where the states uh, do have the same symmetry. So by all means that we could use, uh, we find that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. However, what we will find is that there are topological invariants that uh, distinguish different phases of matter, and using these kind of uh, 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 topological invariants, we can then come up with a very general classification scheme of different phases of matter. Right? So, so what I want to show is that phases of matter classified by topological invariants. And then I want to show that um, these phases will have quite exciting or exotic properties. These phases uh, with exotic properties So one of the highlights will be that we will have quantized transport because we will actually be able to link transport uh, quantities, so, so conductivities, to topological invariants. And this actually means that we will be able to have a uh, uh, kind of very, very high fidelity uh, quantization. Uh, and another kind of interesting or exciting feature is what we call fractionalization. So basically, we start building a material out of certain constituents, for example, out of electrons, which have an elementary charge of E. However, we can have collective excitations that carry uh, just fractions of this charge, for example. Good. How, how can you go from one phase of matter to another if they have different invariants? If, if the invariant is invariant. <laughs> oh, what I, what I mean by this, um, thing, so what I mean by these um, topologic invariances that these are quantities that cannot change continuously. So, so basically, the, if we have a small parameter in the Hamiltonian, what we're going to see is that we can't kind of adiabatically change this invariant. So this invariant is maybe 0 or 1. But what we can actually have is that we tune the parameter in our system, uh, uh, and, and then we will actually have a phase transition from a phase that is described by an invariant which is 0 to another invariant where the, uh, uh, to another phase where the invariant is 1, for example. So just to have a concrete example, you could say that you take your uh, uh, a certain material and you apply a magnetic field to the system. And we might have a phase for small parameters for small fields where some topological invariant uh, uh, x is 0, and then at strong magnetic fields, it might change to x equals to 1. 
but it's a topologic invariant, so it can't be 0.1 or something. It's something that cannot change continuously. <coughs> Let me get started uh, now with the, uh, kind of basically motivate a little bit what we mean by a topological invariant. This is something that we uh, uh, really know quite well from, from, from the field of mathematics. And there's also the kind of mandatory drawing uh, that I have to do because I have to draw a torus at some point. Uh, so, so, so basically what we say is we can now come up with different uh, shapes. So we have like uh, closed manifolds. This can be a torus. But a torus, for example, we can uh, just continuously transform into a coffee mug. Right? So if you think of this torus made thing out of uh, clay, we can now um, bend it and squeeze it to form a coffee mug. So we never have to actually do any cutting. Uh, and another shape would be like a sphere. And a sphere, we can just uh, transform into a plate. Right? So we can, again, just, just squeeze our, 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 our sphere to, to make a plate. And, and at no time do we need any scissors. And this is what I mean by continuous uh, transformation. However, if we want to go from a sphere to a torus, we will actually at some point have to do some cutting or some gluing. Um, the, 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 does this surface has to be differentiable, infinitely differentiable at, at any point of this transformation? Uh, like, like for simplicity, is, I will assume the this. The plate is not infinitely differentiable because if you go from one side to the other, well, it depends on the plate. I mean, can you, it's, uh, I, mean I think if an actual physical plate will still be differentiable at the uh, end. So you would assume that it's infinitely For simplicity, I would do this. So, so and then we can now define the topological invariant, uh, which is the genus, uh, the genus uh, G, and that corresponds to the uh, kind of the number of handles that we have. Um, and this we can now relate to uh, an integral over the curvature, in particular uh, from uh, Gauss Bonnet. We can, we know that the Euler characteristics is given by 1 over 2 pi by the integral over like our closed manifold of k dA. Uh, and now we see that while the curvature changes locally quite a bit, right? I mean, uh, as we just do the squeezing. However, like if we just form an integral over the entire closed surface, we get a number which uh, does not change. And in fact, this number is directly related to the uh, genus. Like this. Right? So, so, so this is now motivating, motivating basically the um, uh, what a topological invariant is. Uh, and the topological invariants that are going to introduce for our uh, kind of physical or condensed matter systems will be uh, quite similar in spirit. We just do integrate over some quantity, and from this we get a quantized, uh, or like we get, a, get an invariant, which can take certain integer numbers, for example, and then we can characterize certain phases of matter by uh, topological invariants. Will you comment later on the, this is a non-local statement and the physics is presumably local. Will you be commenting on how that fits together? Well, in fact, also in the uh, in these physical systems, it will, this kind of non-locality is um, kind of important. So we, we come back to this. So this is also, also in the physical systems, these will be non-local invariants. Good. So, and what I want to do in, in the following, I want to uh, basically discuss uh, two different classes uh, of kind of topological phases, right? So, because when usually when we talk about topological phases, this is just an uh, overarching uh, term for very kind of uh, different specific things that we are interested in. And, uh, and the first one I want to discuss is, uh, I want to look at topology of uh, band insulators. And the neat thing here is that uh, we, we actually, well, I, I was pointing out at the very beginning that usually we have to deal with very complicated, compli uh, very complicated um, many body problems. But the moment that we reduce it to band insulators, we actually, for, for now, forget about interactions. So it's like non interacting. 
And in this case, we get away by just looking at a single particle wave function. Right? So, so that's uh, um, much easier than what we uh, have to do in, in general. And it turns out what we will be able to is like if we just look at these simple band structures, we actually uh, can define topological invariants that will actually allow us to distinguish different types of insulators. And these insulators will have uh, uh, um, some surprising or interesting um, properties. And can I ask a, uh, sure. So, so uh, this, this particle is moving in, in a potential, but yes. the potential itself is created by many, many particles. That's correct, yes. So isn't this the tricky part? Like, how do you know that uh, there is this effective potential? Very good point. So, I mean, since I am, and I think most people are scared of this full problem, what we're going to do is we're going to argue that we can reduce it to a much simpler problem, and then we try to understand this simpler problem, and then uh, we see how, how well this simple problem actually describes uh, experiments. And this is actually what I want to do. I want to write on a very simple um, model. So I write the, the starting point or the motivation is, uh, is graphene. Uh, and as you said, in graphene, we do have many, many effects. We do have like a, a lattice structure which is generated due to many body interactions. <coughs> but I'm saying that, well, uh, all I'm, I, my, my starting point now is I'm saying that I have a perfect uh, the periodic lattice structure, like I have a perfectly periodic <coughs> hexagonal lattice structure, not the one that I'm drawing, but just uh, <laughs> what I'm thinking of. <laughs> And we have a simple tight binding Hamiltonian. We say that on each side we have now just some orbital and the electrons can hop between these orbitals. And moreover, to make it even simpler, I'm going to assume that it's um, spin polarized. So, <coughs> so I even forget about the spin degrees of freedom at this moment. Right? I'm just thinking at this level just of um, spinless fermions hopping on this lattice. And for this I can write down the uh, Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian uh, with well, minus p, something like this, uh, we have now the sum over nearest neighbors, where we have now, uh, if I write in second quantization, uh, we have now just uh, fermions that can hop between nearest neighbors, and this Hamiltonian is quadratic in <coughs> terms of these fermionic operators, so it's very easy to solve. I can solve it by uh, going to reciprocal space, so I can write it then, uh, like so here we do a Fourier transformation, and we can write it in this form. So we have now CK, uh, CK dagger on and sub lattice A, because we recall that this lattice has now uh, uh, has, a, has a unit cell of, of two sides, right? So we have a unit cell of two sides, and the lattice is now uh, um, a translation variant with respect to this unit cell. So I can do the Fourier transform, CK dagger B, and then we have HK, CK A, CK B. <coughs> Good. Right, so all I've done, I've just brought on like a very simple tight binding model. We have a unit cell of two sides. We can Fourier transform it. Uh, and now the Hamiltonian, uh, like the, the Hamiltonian is expressed in terms of this kind of Bloch, Bloch Hamiltonian, which is a two by two matrix. So, so this is a, a two by two matrix. And the two by two matrices, we can now expand in terms of uh, Pauli matrices. So I can say that, well, we have now some vector uh, dk times uh, sigma. Right. So, so this is now the, uh, uh, these dk I actually get from the Fourier transform. I'm not going to write them down, but we, have, uh, we get these and uh, get it expanded in terms of the uh, Pauli matrices. <coughs> but, but the problem that we have now, or the problem that we uh, have to solve now for a given k is just like a single spin in a magnetic field. So, so this is something that we can easily solve. So and the energy E of K is simply given by plus or minus uh, the modulus of, of the vector K. Right? So, so this is now the band structure that we get for our, uh, our um, lattice structure. So, so now we can write down the um, lattice structure, which 
where I just do now uh, a, a cut. So here we have the momentum k, and the momentum k uh, lives now in our two-dimensional Brillouin zone. So, so this is now the, the uh, Brillouin zone for our, our problem, and we have two special points that are labeled capital K and capital K prime, <coughs> because why I'm, I'm labeling these cases, and because if I now draw this uh, band structure K and K prime, and here I plot the, the energy uh, E of K, I get a picture which looks roughly like this. So, 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 so now I'm just uh, uh, plotting the absolute values of these dk for a given k, and I'm just looking at a cut through our Brillouin zone. Right? I'm, in principle, this is of course a, a two-dimensional momentum k, but because of limited drawing abilities, I'm just drawing this um, specific cut. Uh, but I've chosen the cut in, in such a way that we see these important points. These are namely the, uh, the points where we have uh, our Dirac cones. So here we have. Uh, at these kind of specific points, we have a massless, um, massless uh, Dirac Hamiltonian. Is it uh, a massless particle or is it a massless mode? This is a massless mode. So it, to, to call it particle, I believe it's a little bit uh, exaggeration. But I call it massless direct Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah. no, uh, right, but, but it's like a zero, zero mode, right? This, this I can understand, but I wouldn't understand. To, because particle implies that you can move it. So it has its own moment. It's a particle. Yes, it's, it's a quasi-particle. Quasi it's a quasi-particle inside the solid. It's a particle. Quasi-particle has its own momentum, right? Yeah, it does. Yes. It has, it has a momentum. Uh, uh, and here, uh, it is a particular K, or, uh, or you can change the moment, momentum of this particle? You can change it. I mean, you can. Yeah, you can change it. So you can really just write down an effective uh, Dirac Hamiltonian mm -hmm. that describes the low energy physics mm -hmm. at, at these uh, points of momentum. Good. So after this exercise, uh, we, 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 we now have the, the band structure for, uh, for um, graphene. And uh, assuming now half filling, um, we see that the system is a, is a semi-metal. Right? So we have uh, zero energy, a zero kind of density of states at the, um, at the Fermi energy, uh, and it's in a metallic state. And uh, one thing that I want to just point out that these uh, Dirac cones, they are now protected by certain symmetries. In particular, as long as we have both inversion symmetry, like a lattice symmetry, <coughs> that we just invert the lattice so that there's an equivalence between A and B sublattice, and time reversal symmetry, in this case that the Hamiltonian is real for spinless fermions, these protect these uh, Dirac cones. So, so now we can play the following game. We can say that, well, our, these, these Dirac cones, or our um, metallic state, is protected by certain symmetries. So we can just break these symmetries, and we get an insulator. And we can break these symmetries in different ways. As I say, well, one, like this is tall is for time reversal symmetry, is broken, and the other one is we break inversion symmetry. It's broken. So, and in both cases, we will actually open up a gap. In both cases, we do get an insulator. So the band structure is maybe then looking something like this. Here's our K, here is uh, E, K, and here's the same story now. So here we have uh, and here we have still like the so K and K prime points as before. So, so now staying at half filling, we actually see um, like the Fermi energy is here in the middle. We actually do have uh, two insulators and none of those insulators is spontaneously breaking any symmetry. So going back to our old intuition, we would say that, well, since there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can actually now tune a parameter. Right? Maybe we can tune from a parameter that breaks more time reversal uh, to another one that breaks more uh, inversion symmetry, that we can actually go without undergoing a phase transition from one phase to the other. Uh, however, uh, this will not be possible, and this is because we can write down a topological 
invariant uh, distinguishing these two insulators. And this is actually going back to an old work by uh, Duncan Haldane. Uh, so, so, so how can we distinguish now these um, two phases? Like how to distinguish these two insulators? We'll distinguish the insulators. And here we can now come back to uh, the topology, so I can draw a torus again. But now this torus has a has a physical meaning. This torus is the Brillouin zone, right? So recall that the Brillouin zone is, uh, is, a, is is periodic, right? So if I just basically uh, look at two points which are shifted by uh, by one reciprocal lattice vector, this is actually um, an equivalent point. It's the same point. So, so we have basically our k, uh, k lives on a, on a closed manifold on a torus. Uh, and now I can think of... So, so you, you have this latest drawn on a torus. I have... Right, I have my... My lattice is, is infinite. My lattice, my, my lattice in real space is infinite. It's an infinite lattice. When I'm going to reciprocal space, it's a periodic structure. It's basically going from 0 to 2 pi and to 2 pi. Mm -hmm. So my reciprocal space on which my momentum states live, they are periodic. And they are, if I just now think of this structure, it's basically wrapping it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but this is just a 2D version of the torus. But, but it does correspond in the two directions on the blackboard? Well, I mean, we have the, the reciprocal space, which is spanned by the reciprocal lattice vectors, and it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's periodic with respect to the reciprocal lattice vectors. So topologically, the Berlin zone corresponds uh, to a torus. So, that's so, so I would understand if, if the square corresponds to a torus, but why the, the hexagonal shape? Oh, well, just um, instead of drawing it this way, using the periodicity, I can also draw it like that. It's, a, it's the same thing. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so don't get confused by this shape. I mean, just uh, for all practical purposes, think of just the square which we, uh, where we identify 2 pi and pi. This is the same. So it's just basically if you have uh, vectors which, like, if, if they are shifted by, if, if, if the angle here is 90 degrees or something else. So topologically, this is just a, a torus. Now, the Hamiltonian is now a map from our torus uh, to our quantity d here. So this is a quantity to our d of k. And for, for these insulators, we know that d is never 0, because we always have a gap open. So we can actually just map it to this d divided by dk. And then this map, our Hamiltonian, <coughs> corresponds actually to a map of a torus to the unit sphere. Now we can come up with a topological invariant. And this topological invariant corresponds basically to the following. We just uh, draw for these both insulators our unit sphere. And we find <coughs> that on one case, namely the case where we break time reversal symmetry, the point k and k prime, they live actually at the different poles of the sphere. So which means that if we now take all the k points that we have on our torus and uh, uh, that we map onto our sphere, we see that this covers the entire sphere. Right? So basically, we can say that in this case, this map covers the sphere one time, and this gives us now a, uh, some invariant C that we can call 1. Like this is some invariant. If we just look at this case, the k point and the k prime point, they actually live at the same, on the same part of the sphere. And taking the orientation of the surface, we just go back and forth, which means that uh, this is 0. <coughs> so, so now we have defined a topological invariant distinguishing these two uh, cases. Good, and this is uh, <coughs> called the the churn number. 
see that uh, distinguishes these two uh, insulators. And let me now uh, just briefly summarize some of the implications. Just knowing that we have a non-zero churn <coughs> number, uh, if C is not equal to zero, implies implies uh, sort of chiral edge states. And that means in practice that if we take our piece of material that would just be described by this kind of Hamiltonian, is that we have an insulator. Like in the bulk, we have a gap. But if we have open boundaries, we see at the boundaries the system is actually metallic and chiral, which means that the, uh, these states cannot be gapped out. So even if we put disorder to our system, uh, if we just disorder the system, these states are robust to it. Right? So there's no way to gap out these uh, um, these states. Right? So it's a, it's a it's an insulator in the bulk and a metal at the edge. And another neat property is that this invariant can be related to transport quantities. So that we have these have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a quantized uh, Hall conductivity, which is directly related to this number c by some proportionality um, constants. So when you on the edge, you, you break like mirror symmetry. So on the edge, it should be symmetry broke, the insulator, and inside it should still have mirror symmetry and it should still be conducted. No? Oh, these are the two extreme cases. So even even if we break, if we if we kind of uh, if the dominant effect is time reversal symmetry breaking, we are still in the phase that has these properties. So basically, we can, uh, as I mentioned, we can now draw a phase diagram where we have different terms. We have maybe a uh, uh, some terms that break uh, uh, time reversal symmetry and other that break uh, inversion symmetry. So then we get a complex kind of uh, phase diagram with different phases in it. And as long as we are staying in one limit, we actually do this property. And the, the, the important point is as long as we have now a large part where like C is equal to 1, the vacuum outside is C equals to 0. So even if, if very close to the edge for some reason the system is in a different phase, the edge mode would just kind of go a little bit inside. But we will keep this edge mode uh, present. So there's no way to get rid of it because we have a topological difference between the bulk and the vacuum outside. The edge of what? Our sample. Let's say that you have a material. I mean, here I'm assuming the system is infinitely large, and now I'm just cutting out a block of it. And uh, is, is there a length scale which distinguishes like, like when your insulator thing will end and the edge state will be on metal? Like, yeah, uh, these will be kind of material specific in the end. I mean, you can have what is called edge reconstruction, so you can have these kind of actually being pushed in, but but this will actually be kind of specific to, to the materials. You know, uh, um, okay, I was just wondering like if there is some like quantitative way to determine some some length scale which which would like distinguish your bulk insulator from the edge metal phase like I'm not sure if there's a universal answer to this I mean I would think that this becomes material specific but <coughs> what the game people sometimes play is that they introduce a parameter of the Hamiltonian or your bilinear etc it changes smoothly <coughs> as you go from the bulk into the vacuum and so then you could define some you know, and it crosses through zero typically, you would say from positive to negative on the inside and the outside. Now the result you could prove is that if you were to solve the one dimensional problem in this case on the boundary, that edge state of which um, Frank tells us is going to be exponentially localized near the boundary. Now the actual length of this exponential, the, right, that would depend on how you define your mass to use as well that determine the Hamiltonian that changes. So that may be not universal. But the result that is universal is that far enough away on either side you will have an insulator and that state will be localized exponentially. Good. And one thing I mean just to conclude this part on kind of topological uh, the topology of bands. I mean, this is like one specific example, and uh, I hope that it illustrates the main ideas. I mean, the main ideas being we start from a simple type binding, like from a single particle description of the, like a non interacting description of the problem. We go to Fourier space, uh, where we then have to deal with like rather small matrices, in this case, just two by two matrices. And then on rather general grounds, we can come up with different, top, like in this case, one specific topological invariant that distinguishes these 
insulators. And for this invariant in, in, in particular, we see that we don't need any symmetries, right? So in particular, we had to break some symmetries to make it uh, an insulator. But it turns out now this, on the same lines, we can continue and we can then ask, well, what if we assume, what if we kind of enforce certain symmetries? Then we can have so-called symmetry-protected topological phases where the two insulators are only distinguished as long as certain symmetries are kept. So <coughs> for time reversal symmetry, we can play this game by opening a gap using uh, by, by spin-orbit coupling. And then there can be the so-called Z2 topological insulators, which are only different as long as time reversal symmetry is present. Uh, and one, one step further is you can also include lattice symmetries, for example, point group symmetries of a lattice. And then uh, this leads to so-called uh, higher order topological insulators, um, which I actually discussed um, at, at this um, program. Yeah? You define the world a well-defined system. Yes. You know, electrons on sites, mm -hmm. and how from what's it? So, what does it mean to say you break time reversal symmetry? If the original definition was time symmetric, mm -hmm. how do you break it? And what did you change that was not in your original definition that made it time asymmetric? Well, we can, we can basically. Uh, uh, Add, uh, add a magnetic field to break uh, time reversal symmetry externally. So, so this would be one option. So there are different. So, so, so you have a material. I mean, this is like general what we do in quantum <laughs> metaphysics that we just perturb our system externally by breaking. We can break, for example, spatial symmetries by uh, anisotropic pressure or um, time reversal by applying magnetic field and, and the like. Okay. Good. Yeah, and as I just pointed out that. Uh, some of the more recent developments is that uh, we also take into account um, lattice symmetries, and then there can be what is so-called higher order topological insulators, where we have now uh, uh, systems which are insulating in the bulk, but they might just have gapless edges, uh, the, the gapless corners, or in higher dimensions, uh, these could be systems where there are uh, gapless hinges and uh, uh, states so and the like. So, so there is a lot of development, and uh, it's basically an endless game to play because you can add more and more symmetries and come up with more and more involved topological invariants. Good. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I mean, one of the. Great. I'm. <laughs> 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 Having you used it all, or? No, you okay, good. So let me just um, briefly come to the um, um, second part because here. As I said, it's just about understanding the physics of a single electron in a periodic lattice. Now I want to go to 10 to the 23 uh, in a small jump. <laughs> so, and uh, what I want to look at are so-called topological um, spin liquids. <coughs> so, so here the story is now a bit different. Well, here I started, like I said, like from these interactions, all what I get is just my periodic lattice, and then I just look at a single electron. Now, I'm saying that I, I'm, I'm interested in so-called uh, mod insulators. So basically, I'm saying that I'm uh, in, a, in a system where I could, in principle, start from a tight binding model, which is in a metallic state. Now I add to it a strong interaction between the particles, like a strong electron-electron uh, repulsion. And that can lead to uh, a case where I have a scenario of, for example, my lattice, and on each side I have an electron that is localized. So on each side I have a localized electron. And then I can ask that, well, in terms of my electronic degrees of freedom, like here I've only looked at electronic degrees of freedom, that's an extremely boring state because this, the electrons are just sitting here. However, the electrons do have other um, degrees of freedom, particularly we have a spin degree of freedom. So we can ask, what are the spins of the system doing? Right? And uh, this we can describe by some. So, so if we go to the limit of infinite, in, in, infinitely strong interactions, we would have two to the n uh, degenerate states because I wouldn't care about the spin at all. However, if I'm going to finite interactions, then we will have some effective interactions between <coughs> spins. So, for example, two spins uh, might form uh, um, a singlet. So I will get some effective Hamiltonian, where we have something of this type, where we have now some 
minimal model just coupling the spins on, on our lattice. So now, if we just look around in nature, we find that different crystals form all sorts of different, uh, all different materials form different crystals. So for example, it could be a simple square lattice. Uh, and in fact, it has been um, shown that if we take this simple minimal model and we put it on a square lattice, or for that matter, on any other bipartite lattice, like where we can have a two coloring of the lattice, what we get is antiferromagnetic order. Like if uh, T is small enough. And that falls into the category of simple spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? Because then we could say that, well, clearly this state of matter is different from a simple paramagnet, where, for example, we just apply a very strong uh, magnetic field and align all the spins to a simple product state uh, where all spins are pointing up. So, so we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, let's check. Uh, but now, let's say that uh, we have a more fancy lattice. And in fact, many kind of, as I said, uh, different materials have different lattice structures. And some of them have so-called frustrated lattice structures. What do I mean by frustrated lattices? So if we, for example, take our spin model and we say that, well, we have a spin pointing in this direction here, maybe the other one wants to point in the other for forming this kind of uh, nail state that we can easily form here. But if we have a triangle, this guy here wouldn't really know what to do. Right? So that's why this would be a frustrated lattice, like a triangle be frustrated lattice. And there are various types of frustrated lattices that we find in nature. So, for example, we have uh, triangular lattices where we just have tons of these triangles just connected by their uh, edges and so on and so forth. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, and you get the idea of me. Uh, or we have a um, so called a kagomi lattice where the name comes from Jap some Japanese basket where we have corner connected. Uh, we have corner-connected triangles and so on. Right? So this is a, a cargo lattice. And all of them are realized in different materials. For example, there's a, a Herbert Smithite, uh, which is one mineral which actually has this kind of structure. And indeed, it has a, a spin one half degrees of freedom on these um, edges. So, so here I said that was, was, we had a good guess for the ground state. And numerically, it could be confirmed that this guess is actually correct. Here we're actually having a much harder time, right? So because here, well, if we just have these antiferromagnetically coupled um, spins, what is the ground state going to be? It's a, it's a surprisingly hard question. What is the ground state of this kind of quantum mechanical problem? Uh, and well, since it's a difficult problem, we are allowed to, to come up with some interesting guesses. Uh, and one of the proposal proposal for the uh, ground state wave function is a so-called resonating valence bond state. So what's that? So so we had we we can start by just looking at two spins. Let's say that we would have a a system of only two spins. But here we know exactly what the ground state would be. If we have two spins coupled antiferromagnetically, we would get a spin singlet, right? So we would find a state where we have up, down, minus, down, up. Uh, one half. So, so this is our um, spin, um, spin singlet. So we just basically can draw it something like this. We have like two spins, and we're forming a spin singlet. So, and what's good for two spins, we could say that, well, now they do the same thing on our, our lattice structure. So let's say that we have now our, our triangular lattice structure. And now we just form singlets. We could say that, well, we can now, each, each spin can find a friend to pair with. And uh, we get a, a state, which is certainly not a bad guess for the ground state, right? Because now every spin has like a spin to pair with, and uh, they can lower the energy this way. But we see that this is clearly not an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. So we could say that, well, we just try to make it even better guess by perturbatively adding, uh, saying that at perturbation theory, we get resonating uh, 
singlets. So they can change the position. Right? So they can go from the horizontal to the vertical state, and by this, further lower the energy. Right? So instead of having a single product state where all of these spins just point, uh, where all of them have just a fixed partner to pair with, they're actually becoming more polygamic and uh, kind of uh, have now different singlet coverings that we could have. I mean, they can just resonate around uh, of, of sorts. And we would actually go through all possibilities there are. So this, is a, this type of state is now called a resonating uh, valence bond state. Right? So we have now a superposition of all possible dimer coverings. Right? I'm not saying that this is a ground state to our specific Hamiltonian. This is just a guess for a ground state wave function. And it turns out for certain Hamiltonians, it is actually a very good guess for the ground state. And now, using the freedom that we have, we can say, let us now study this simple toy wave function. And in the last minutes, I just want to kind of point out a few properties of this wave function. So first of all, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. So neither spatial nor spin symmetries are broken. Right? Like a singlet has a full SU2 symmetry of, of our spin system, and we, have a, we don't break any lattice symmetries. So in this case, we would say that, well, that is a simple symmetric state, and the naivest guess would be it's adiabatically, product, it's adiabatically connected to a simple product state of, 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 of spins. Uh, like a simple power magnet. But it turns out it's not. And the, the, the reason it's not is that this state actually has uh, what's called topological order. And uh, the topological order manifests itself by, uh, in terms of the so-called topological degeneracy, which means we're just drawing again a torus. And now I say that, well, let, let me just look at this system, let me look at the resonating valence bond state uh, on, on a torus. And one thing that I see is I can now come up with a topological invariant. We see here the minimum model that we write down, in fact, we can extend it by, to all kind of local resonance terms, uh, leaves a certain quantity invariant. Because what I can do is I can just look at cuts through my lattice. Right? So because now I put my lattice on a torus, and I have like, this periodic structure, so now it just basically draw these lines, like these lines correspond to loops around the torus like this, or like this, vice versa. And now I can count the number of dimers, or the number of singlets I cut. And we see that it's zero here, it's two here, it's four here, it's uh, four here, uh, zero here, zero here. And, uh, well, here you can do the counting yourself. I mean, one thing that we, uh, that we then notice is that if we apply any local term, any local resonance term, I can see that I can never change an odd number to an even number. Right? So, so basically what I find is that we have a topological degeneracy in terms of uh, even, even, odd, even, uh, even, odd, and uh, odd, odd. And what we can then prove, actually, in the thermodynamic limit, that these different states cannot be distinguished by any local measurement. Right? If you are a local observer, so I only allow you to look at part of your system, something like this, you're not able to tell in which of these states you are. The only way for you to figure out is actually if you kind of spin around once around the entire torus. And this is the only way for you to figure out in which of these states you are. And, uh, and that's why also these states will be exponentially, uh, uh, the, uh, the splitting between these states will be exponentially small in, in terms of the um, system size. Good. Now I'm just going to give a very brief <coughs> overview about uh, what else I wanted to say and uh, come to uh, a few of the challenge, challenges that we, we are still facing. So, so I mentioned the topological degeneracy and interest, another exciting property of these states is so-called fractionalization. <coughs> so... In particular, we can see this already um, with a very simple picture here. <coughs> Let's say that we do have this um, resonating valence bond state, and I'm removing one electron. I remove one of these spins here, so I create a hole here. There's nothing, but it leaves behind an unpaired spin. So, so I have now a hole and a spin. 
But now you can see, because the system doesn't break any of these symmetries, I can rearrange my, 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 my singlets. And well, this, of course, happens in all copies. And what we see is it actually allows us to separate the charge, like the whole on, from the spin. Right? So now we just do something which in principle is very unphysical. We just separate the charge and the spin of the electron. But in these kind of states, this is something that we are allowed to do. Turns out if we create these sort of fractional excitations, it's getting even more exotic because these excitations can be anionic. Uh, this is limited to two-dimensional systems, which means that if I were to look at the statistics of these particles, if I take these kind of fractionalized excitations and I just treat them as particles, which they are, these are quasi-particles, I exchange them, I can have cases where if I exchange two of them, they might have some very exotic statistics. Right? So there might not be fermions or bosons, there might be something in between. And uh, one of the, um, and this is kind of one of the fingerprints that might actually be detectable in, in spectroscopic measurements, because if we do spectroscopic, like if we just maybe do neutron scattering or uh, like, uh, these kind of uh, anions might have uh, some, some um, signatures. Good. And uh, yeah, so, so both of these examples that I've shown, both this kind of um, whole Dane model and the resonating valence bond state, they are kind of already um, around for a while. But again, what I wanted to point out that from this whole Dane model, several other models in very similar spirit arise, uh, arose. Um, that we still don't, don't really understand. And the same thing here, they are still kind of very open questions. So for example, we, while, while in the case of non-interacting particles, we do have a, what we believe is a complete classification. So we can come up with a huge table and say that, well, given these symmetries, there are that many different phases, uh, and you can just tabulate everything. And if you find two non-interacting systems that have the same topological invariance, you are absolutely positive that you can find a path connecting them adiabatically. For the interacting case, we don't have such a thing yet. Right? So even if you just kind of pull out like all the books you know and you just take all the invariants that you know of, we cannot be sure that two, two symmetric states having the same invariants are actually adiabatically connectable. So we don't have a complete classification. And another point, a very important point, is that here I'm just... I've been like a real theorist. I just say that, well, I just <coughs> use a proposal for a state and let us look at the properties of the state. But we still, and this is like one of the big challenges right now, try to find materials that actually are described by this kind of exotic orders. Right? So they're very hot candidates at the moment, but we're still uh, not sure about many of the details. And coming to an end. <laughs> but um, and one of the things, like one of the important things on, on this search is also that we need to be able to to understand kind of real kind of physical or microscopic Hamiltonians. And there we are facing the problem that I mentioned, that we have to deal with an e to the 10 to the 10 to 3 dimensional Hilbert space. And there we need to develop new numerical tools that actually allow us to do these calculations approximately. Uh, and by this kind of can tell, having a certain microscopic model, do we get this interesting physics? Right? Take a simple <coughs> model on a certain lattice does it give rise to uh, anionic excitation, yes or no? Right? And if we do these kind of excitation, what are the kind of dynamical signatures that we um, could hope to, hope to see? Good. Yeah, I think that this kind of uh, concludes my talk. Questions? Uh, I'll say in this case number one, you consider... Uh -huh. uh, and they would ask, uh, what about ground state in these cases? Uh, do, do they do, do they degenerate in ground states when you have this direct camera? Or, I mean, or is there is no degeneracy? Right, so for the systems I hear, if I take, for example, this specific model that I looked at, yeah. the, this uh, Holdane model, yeah. Uh, there's no ground state degeneracy if you put it on any closed manifold. If you, it doesn't matter if you put it on a sphere or on a torus, it, uh, it has a unique ground state. Uh -huh. But, the, but the, and in this way, in the, for this to uh, insulate, it would be different ground state? Well, the ground state is different. It's different, but unique in each case, right? Well, let's uh, make sure. So we, we have, I just created two insulators. Yeah. And 
in principle, I could fine-tune these parameters such that the band structures look identical. Yeah. But you look at the band structures, there's no way to tell apart. Yeah. If you put them, the, they have, if you have a closed manifold, they are both having a unique ground state. No topological degeneracies or nothing. However, there is a difference if you're putting them on a on a on a uh, on an open system. So, for example, if you put it on a cylinder, mm -hmm. where you have now one open end, or uh, two open ends, yeah, but I mean you have like this direction open, um, then if you take the trivial insulator, it will still be an insulating state, right? So basically, on on this side, it will just still be a band structure, something like that, mm -hmm. like here being uh, momentum in in Y, like where you, or, or in X, whatever this direction is. And in the topological case, what you will actually see is that there's this kind of chiral edge mode. So you will always have this, this, uh, this kind of chiral mode connecting these. So you will always have a metallic mode that resides, that is localized at the edge that uh, I, I pointed out earlier, like where I said here, right? So you but but they, they are not probably different by boundaries. Uh, no, they are, at the boundaries, they are different. So in the one case, nice. you... But the important point is that, you, that, you, that here you have really this robust edge mode. Right? So in principle, probably you can also fine-tune your system that the, this trivial case has some zero energy excitation at the edge. Mm -hmm. But then you just add some junk to it. You just make it disordered. And in this case, whatever you had goes away. While here, no matter what you do, you will keep this kind of mode. Right? So the robustness of this mode is very important. You mentioned uh, new numerical techniques or ways to calculate these things. And of course, we don't have quantum computers, but we're beginning to have quantum simulators. Uh -huh. If you had access to a quantum simulator and you wanted to calculate these topological properties, is there anything known about whether the quantum simulator would have to have these properties to tell you anything? Or, or right, so there are, I mean, there's a few, few different answers to this question. So first of all, in terms of the numerical uh, techniques, the first and the, the most powerful tool at this moment, I think, are still kind of classical computers. Of so there we are just working on ideas how to compress this information. So it turns out that even though you have this 10, e to the 10 to the 23 dimensional Hilbert space, the relevant uh, sub-manifold that you actually need is much smaller, and there are techniques to compress this, like you can compress JPEG pictures, you can also compress quantum states. So this is the way to do it still classical. Now, if you have optical lattice simulator or emulators, for example, uh, there is a lot of effort. So, for example, uh, there are already the first experiments where this um, Holdane type model or like Hofstetter type models, like, like lattice, these, these kind of lattice models have been realized. And there they can actually uh, measure certain topological invariants. So, so there are uh, proposals and also experiments <laughs> showing that the churn number that are introduced here as a topological invariant can actually be measured in these simulators. So, so, so that actually um, works already like a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you, Frank.